It's that time on Friday when Lorenzo Alexander stops by in the studio. We love when he comes by. The Lowdown with Lorenzo Alexander, brought to you by Hutches. Hello, Lorenzo. How are you? Thanks I'm doing pretty in. good. Yeah, how you guys doing? Do you good. have any part of you get fired up about playing against the team that you spent seven years with? Yeah, I mean, it was. I've probably been almost gone as long as I played for him. I think I played <laughs> for him last time was 2012, and yeah. so... Seven majority of that sentimental value has kind of left me. I mean, the first year when I was in Arizona, I think we played him on the second year, and that was kind of cool because I still knew a lot of the guys on the team. But it's probably, I think, maybe two, three guys left. Trent, William, uh, yeah, Trent Williams, um, Ryan Kerrigan, and then Nick Sunberg, who's a long snapper, left. It's an interesting team. We talked with uh, Clinton Portis earlier this week. Okay, yeah, my guy, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You want to hear what Clinton said? What did he say? We told him this was Wednesday, and you had your, <laughs> your rest day, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Clinton Portis took note of that. Here's what he said on Wednesday. I just heard you all say Lorenzo missed practice because he, he got a rest day. Rest I day. almost fell out. <laughs> a rest day, Lorenzo Alexander. I remember Lorenzo being a young guy, man, trying to find his way. He actually played some fullback. He played some offensive line. He played some defense. He played some linebacker. He was just one of those weapons, a guy who did everything, looking for an opportunity. And once he finally got it, once he got to Buffalo and you all found his lane and uh, gave him the opportunity to showcase his talent, he took advantage of it. And that's the Lorenzo Alexander I know, a uh, young guy who was on the come up and looking for an opportunity. And once he finally got his opportunity, he never looked back. So that's the Zoe I know, relentless, uh, God-fearing man is going to give you all he has. So seeing that and, and being able to be uh, happy for Lorenzo and his family, knowing he's a family man and knowing everything he put in and where he started those days that he kind of questioned himself and, you know, can he play this game at this level? And to look back 10 years later, you see Zoe still on the field, still doing big things and getting veteran rest days out of all things. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. CP, well, I was with him when I was a young man uh, in the league, you know. So I was there from 06 to 2012, and he was there for a majority of them. I think maybe one year, my last year, he wasn't there. Uh, but he was one of the guys I looked up to. Um, he was obviously a, a superstar, first-round draft pick. Um, he got a lot of slack as far as the way he practiced, but the way he played the game, I mean, he played hard. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the guys I turned to and, and loved, the way he just went out there and competed every single day. And so, uh, yeah, so obviously he knows the type of mentality I had as far as being out there every single day, going hard, practice squad, and making my way, and now to, to have a rest day. It is funny to kind of <laughs> to see the, 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 the development of my career over the years. We need a new name for that. Let's not call it a rest day. What should we call it? Just make up an injury. No, yeah, it's funny. No, Veterans it's Privilege yeah, Day. day. <laughs> Portis yeah. Privilege Day. Portis joined us. He, you can see him he, with the, the face He's on mm-hmm. the sidelines at Washington's practice. Right. Because he does radio down there. Yeah, he's still very involved with the organization, yeah. him and Santana. I believe. But I said to him, he used to dress up for his media appearances, right? Oh, yeah, back in the day. I forgot. Somebody shut that down on him. But uh, <laughs> him and Chris Cooley used to really get into it. And it yeah. used to be kind of funny, you know. So he used to have all these different characters. And then they used to normally put, like, a skit together sometimes based on who we were playing. So Tom, sometimes they might be out there hunting the Rams or, <laughs> you know, you see this this character ca- caricature that he has of himself. So he had, like, three or four different personalities. But it was really cool. He had fun with it. And I think people really loved it. Cooley's nuts, isn't he? He's a little Co- off his Cooley's rocker. different too. We had a yeah. we had a a, a great a group of guys that were very <laughs> that were very unique and um, great personalities to be around. That's funny. Um, so this week, you know, we've got Washington and Murph and I were just talking about this in the previous segment, and Murph actually asked Coach about it in his pregame interview for the radio broadcast on Sunday. But when in the early stages of the week, you really didn't know. For sure, anyway, right, yeah. who was going to play quarterback. So how does Coach Frazier work that with you guys, knowing, you know, it could potentially go either way for which quarterback you're going to play against? Right. And how much does the game plan maybe pivot or shift? You know, and I'm not looking for X's yeah, and O's. Yeah, I'm right, looking for yeah. a degree uh, of change I mean, it's, in a given we, week. We've had this come up, you know, throughout, throughout the season and out throughout my career, and you really try to game plan um, – based on the schematics of their offense and what they like to do. Because offensive coordinators, um, they may vary a little bit as far as who's who's at the helm, as far as who's playing quarterback. 
but they have a, a foundation, a nucleus of players that they really like and that they're comfortable with. And so that's what you have to game plan towards. And then obviously once you figure out who's actually going to be back there, uh, because these these guys aren't, you know, one is not like a, a running quarterback and one is passing. So right. you still can game plan for, you know, the base passes. What we do know, though, is it's going to probably be a little bit more of a conservative game plan. Right. You know, run the ball. Obviously got Adrian Peterson back there. Screens have really hurt us. So maybe putting the ad um, an uptick in some of those plays in the game. Uh, boots, because uh, obviously Haskins is, is young and athletic, so getting him out of the pocket and making the reads easier for him. So there's something that you can maybe pr predict and understand as far as when we're out there playing. But as far as how Coach Frazier calls the game, um, I don't think there's going to be a drastic difference as far as the, the menu of plays. Maybe be, he's a little bit more aggressive because of who we're playing, because you always want to try, try to take advantage of the youth or lack of experience. Right a player has, especially at the quarterback position, because, you know, so much rides on that position as far as getting guys in the right places. With Lorenzo Alexander, and you mentioned Adrian Peterson, uh, two of the top six all-time rushers in NFL right. history on this field here, which is pretty cool. Well, what can you tell us about Peterson? I mentioned this to Coach McDermott today. Um, Peterson and Gore, uh, advanced age, I'm not talking about you, advanced age, and yeah. yet neither one of them are on a, a, a retirement tour here. They're no, big parts of their yeah. offense. Yeah, I mean, they're both still playing well, and that's a testament to obviously their God-given uh, gifts, but more so um, just how they've cultivated those those abilities over the years as far as, you know, their workout regimen, uh, their attention to detail, uh, them, them investing in themselves as far as being a professional and still playing at a very high level. Um, he AP has always had a, a great knack of, of – uh, finding corners and getting to the edge with his jump cuts, his great vision, um, and, and just running hard, running hard and physical. And he gets stronger as the game goes on. And so uh, in order for us to stop him, we're going to have to definitely game tackle him, make things cloudy, um, and just like any backs. If we can get their feet to stop and, and make them cut before they want to, uh, that's when they're the, um, the most ineffective in a game plan. Because I mean, last three games, and let's not forget, last week he played on a high ankle sprain, right. limited in practice this week, probably in the same kind of boat. Mm -hmm. I know they have the bye next week, so maybe he's just trying to get to that. Right. But um, 4.8 yards per carry in his last three games. It looks yeah. like they found something there that that's working for to at least some degree in their offense. Well, yeah, I think that's one of the strengths of their offensive line is run blocking. And then you also think about uh, the shift in uh, head coach uh, with, with an intern being there, Callahan, being, uh, yeah. Callahan being the offensive line coach right. and really want to put a premium on running the ball. And obviously him and AP, I think, have a, a better relationship than the former regime. And so now he's going to feature the guy that he has a great relationship with and um, obviously put his offensive lineman in the most advantageous spot right. by running the rock more, and they're doing that at a high tick. And then you can take a lot of pressure off the quarterback um, play as well if you're able to run the ball. And, and a guy like AP who can still play at a high level, why wouldn't you want to put the ball yeah. in his hands as much as possible? Talking to Lorenzo Alexander, about this week, Lorenzo, you said it, uh, McDermott said it, I think Monday even, about um, how to solve the issues that came up last Sunday, and it was a focus on fundamentals. Yeah, What does right. that mean? What do you mean focusing on fundamentals? Um, I think sometimes in, a, in in the course of a season or just life in general, you get away from some of the things that allow you to be great because you're trying to overcorrect. Maybe a team has a – or a offense has a big play on you, and you say, oh, oh let, me, let me fix a little something and change it, and then you maybe widen out a little bit as a three technique or a linebacker. You may uh, cheat over and get out of your alignments, or you may try to run through a gap and not use your hands. And so little things – like that, not guessing on plays, not having good eyes. So good, not having good eyes, not having good feet, and not good, having good hands can lead to explosive plays and not being able to rip off, play violent, and playing downhill so that we can stop the run. Because that's, that's obviously what we're talking about. And those yeah. are the three things that you really need in order to be effective in the run game. So when you get out of practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, what does that focus on fundamentals look like? Um, I think it's just addressing it, first of all, in, before you go out the there, room. and then meeting room, and then having, you know, showing it on film, like where we broke down at and how our fundamentals play into that so you can have a visual picture. Because sometimes people say stuff but don't show you, and it's hard to sure. self-correct. So doing that in the film room, which we did by watching the game collectively as a defense. And then when you go out on the um, practice field, the things that we identified, uh, it's the coach's job and really player's job to maybe in pre-practice, uh, work the drills around those things that you uh, may have got a little bit of lackadaisical on and, and really focus on those things. And so whether for us it's hitting a sled, using our hands, step punch, ripping off of things, uh, ripping off of blocks, 
Uh, whether it's defense alignment, working on their alignment, um, you know, maybe, you know, doing a, a two-on-one drill with some offensive linemen uh, so they can feel the double team, feeling the linebacker come downhill and the lineman coming off and recapturing their gap with their hands and their eyes. So those are things that you can work on in practice that sometimes just kind of get a little rusty for whatever reason. We always need a refresher because it's, the emphasis goes so much on scheme and plays and what does that team like to do sometimes that you get away from the basics that's going to allow you to win your one-on-one -on -one matchups. And again, the NFL is all about man whooping a man. And the only way you can do that consistently is by having great fundamentals and technique because uh, talent is only just a starter. You, you win cons consistently in this league by having great fundamentals and technique. And then, you know, the penalties have been an issue too, maybe a little bit more so on the offensive side of the ball than the defensive side. But we, I asked Coach about it on Monday because I know in the past he's had officials at practice right. with you guys throwing flags to kind of keep you aware, even in the practice setting. That's not the case this year. But he did say that he brought in a retired official last week to talk to you guys. What kind of ground was covered? Was he kind of outlining what they look for, what they emphasize right. Where the flag's going to come out? What what was the give yeah, and take the there? That's the biggest thing is you know what the officials are looking for, how the game has changed because some of the blocks that you make now in the league, is, and especially when you're finishing guys, yeah. they're trying to get they you know player safety, and so okay. they're more amped to throw a flag where uh, you know when I first got in this league, it was like oh he, he he just dogged that dude out. Now they're throwing <laughs> it's a flag and it's a bad play even yeah. though and so if you have guys that have overlapped that time and that progression, sometimes it's hard to make that transition right away because you go into, you know, old school mode. I'm about to finish you off and really dominate you so you know what it's all about. So this next play, it's a little bit easier for me. Right. And you can't always do that in the NFL and the world we play in now. So just being smarter, being more aware, um, understanding what officials are looking for and calling. So now you're like, oh, okay, last week I got a hold. No, let me pull off. I got the block. We got the first down. I don't re yeah. really need to dominate this guy now. Yeah, the back's by me already. I don't Yeah, there's no reason to go that extra mile, even though, you know, you know, from my perspective, I would love to be able to do it. You yeah. can't do it because you're going to hurt the team at the end of the day. Right. And do you want to get to your lowdown, your keys to this game? But one big question and a career question for you. You, you started your career in Washington, yeah. right? Dra no, not drafted there. Not drafted, undrafted. Undrafted. Yeah. What happened to them? What happened to Washington? When I was a little kid. Right, yeah. Were... I mean, well, I wasn't a part of that great regime. I Obviously, I got Gibbs 2.0, and I've been to the play. We went to the playoffs, I think, twice while I was you there. Once Gibbs. with him, and yeah. then once with Mike Shanahan. Um, you know, when, when I look at the organization, if I had to put my thumb on it, um, it's, 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 there's no consistency. So while I was there, I had three head coaches in seven years. And I, when I look around the league, the teams that are often perennial playoff teams, there's continuity at the head coaching spot, at the GM spot. They work together. They understand um, their roles, and they have a great synergy. And I think that has been probably, uh, probably the biggest pitfall of Washington, just not having great synergy in the front office that leads to having a, a, the core, your core players who you draft or bring in being there for a long time. So you have a lot of fluidity within the organization, and that's never going to allow you to really develop an identity and a sense of who you are to really capture, you know, winning on a consistent basis. And I remember having a conversation with Lorenzo, probably tail end of training camp, just about where this franchise was in its maturation into a defined culture, right. a, a hard line philosophy on how to build it here. And, and Lorenzo said, I've been on teams where we had 10 pro bowlers and didn't make the playoffs. And I was like, mm -hmm. I think I know which team he's referencing there. <laughs> right, yeah, and, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, so it's all about continuity. And, and in our, you know, culture today, and it, you see it everywhere. It's not just, you know, in Washington. It's just in our society in general. It's a win now type of concept. And you don't have much time to create that continuity. You have to show some type of improvement or have ownership willing to be patient so that you can kind of grow that identity and that culture that's going to eventually um, um, manifest winning. And and sometimes, you know, coaches, if you have a bad record if you're 4-12 and 12 in the second season, yeah. it's like, oh, the fan base gets in an uproar. We got to switch. You got to fire. When it could have been that next year where you make that growth because now you have two or three years of your guys in there. You're really starting to bring, shape it in. Guys are really starting to understand it. But now here comes a new head coach or a new GM, and the, and the whole mindset or vision can be completely different. You have to restart from scratch pretty much. And then you look at some of the most patient franchises in this league, you know, Pittsburgh, yeah, six rings, <laughs> right. six trophies. Giants traditionally have been a pretty patient franchise. They're kind of a little scattered right now, but it looks like they're reloading in a way that 
should spell success eventually. We like to believe that growth is going on here, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, things have been on an uptick, I think, you know, since me arriving here in 2016, I've, I've seen a positive uh, shift within the building and within the guys that we're bringing in and the way we're playing. And so, um, obviously, it's up to us to really um, win games to allow that to continue to grow, um, you know, because I think Sean's a great head coach. Brandon's a great GM, and I think they work very well together. They both respect each other and, and stay in their lanes. Um, and if they're continue to conti able to work together and continue to implement this vision, I mean, I think this franchise is going is setting itself up for a, a, a standard that's going to be consistent to, to winning and the fan base being happy with the product. All right, let's get to the lowdown. Chris, get us going here. These are Lorenzo's keys to the game this Sunday against Washington. Yeah, number one you've got here is discipline. Right, and, we, and we've talked about this a little bit um, as far as the pre-snap penalties, not putting ourselves in, you know, first and 15 or first and 20 because we, we have a holding penalty or defensively lining up offsides. Um, those are the things that uh, when you play a good team um, or if you want to become a good team, you cannot be uh, creating self-inflicted wounds. And that's something that's kind of been our, our Achilles heel um, all year. And at some point, uh, man to man, we have to make that correction and, and get that job done consistently throughout the game. Number two on Lorenzo's list of uh, keys, prevent big plays. You guys have been good at that on defense. Yeah, we've been good, but when we give up drives – or points on drives, it's because of some type of big play. Whether it's a shot off a double move, for us this year has been on screens. Uh, so we're having a, 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 an idea and awareness of, uh, of the situation. So for us, if it's second and long after we just stuffed a run um, or got a sack, we have to understand that we've been hurt on screens, so having an awareness. This doesn't mean you need to slow down and, and stop you from using your eyes and your feet. But have an awareness. So when you see a kid that's saying, okay, this is a screen, you need to go trigger, get your guy or a defensive lineman, stop your rush because you're not that great of a rusher to be just scot-free, put your foot in the ground and retrace. And so collectively being able to do that um, on defense throughout a game. We, we came across this stat from our friends at ESPN NFL Matchup. Uh, explosive plays allowed by a defense, uh, number of 15-yard or more rushes and 20-yard or more receptions allowed. The Bills are fifth in the league. Only four teams have allowed fewer. So... I think you probably have in mind that 65-yard touchdown run the other day, but overall, yeah. first half of the season, you guys yeah. done a good job with the yeah, explosive Yeah, a good play. job. See, but I, see, for me, when, I, when I'm critiquing ourselves, I'm not okay with a good – I want to be the best. You yeah. know, I'm not okay with just, oh, we're top five, but those, those that to, for us to be top five, we've given up some big plays that have allowed to points. And that's our, our thing. Nobody can, I don't think, go down 80 yards meticulously, five, eight, you know, seven – uh, and, and, and just creep down. Sure. The only way they score points, field goals, or touchdowns is when we give up big plays. And the big plays, the majority out of those 14 or 15 plays have been off of screens. And so that's why I think we really need to have a heightened awareness because for us to be an elite and take this thing to another level, we have to minimize those, those, those style of plays. One more question about the screen pass. Is there something fundamental about the setup of your defense that maybe you're, you're susceptible to big screen passes? Um, I think we have, you know, guys getting up the field as far as pass rushers sometimes, and so that slows us down and not, not always being aware of it. There are some uh, things being a split safety defense, especially in our cover four set, where the wheel is oftentimes on the backside left alone when it's a three-by-one, three receivers to one side, one receiver to the other. You, the wheel on it, to that one receiver side is sometimes by itself on that running back. And if you get one or two linemen out, now he has to play the piano, play it slow, and hopefully you get some of your Sharks guys that are retracing and running to the ball. But if you have one guy that's out of sync or a guy that doesn't take a proper angle, as we saw in the Miami game, you know, that, that play that should go for maybe six yards can, can explode to a 30-yard play. What do you mean play the piano? Play the like piano means one. slow play it. You know, kind of back, using your feet back and forth, try to get the old lineman to commit and maybe miss you, and then maybe you can go make a play. Let your help catch and up. And let your help, yeah, catch little up. Full-blown lounge singer. Versus <laughs> going to take a shot right now and missing, and he and takes, he's, he he's gone on, yeah. you know, on, on the sideline. Gotcha. You got uh, one more low down? One more low down. Affect the quarterback, which has a whole different ring to it now, knowing that Haskins is starting. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, we w really want to be able to get after Haskins. I mean, obviously, with some of our coverages, um, making him second-guess himself because he does have a lack of experience being at the helm. Um, also, maybe speeding him up, um, obviously with great pass rush, getting after him a little bit and uh, making him make a decision before he really wants to. And so those are some of the things that you want, want to be able to do, whether you're blitzing him or with your four-man rush, 
um, and take advantage of, of his youth at the position. Yeah. There you go, the lowdown with Lorenzo Alexander. Uh, you, your children here in uh, Buffalo and Western New York, you're right in the heart of Halloween uh, season, right? I mean, these kids, they are perfectly aged oh, for oh, that. Perfectly right? aged, and they were soldiers last night. None um, of them blew away, did they? No, Nobody they had any good. loose fitting costumes because they, they might have yeah, turned they into made kites it. last they night. Made it. We, they made <laughs> it. They went out for about an hour in the rain and the wind uh, while I manned the house and, and handed out oh, candy. You were in. Yeah, I was out. Yeah, I picked Were you that busy? Job. Huh? Were you? Well, I yeah. was not busy last I, night. I was um, more visitors than I expected. There okay. was a, a good group, but we live in like a cul de sac family oriented okay, neighborhood. Yeah, so yeah. it's like a lot of kids that just live there. So I think they hit the block. So you hit it was the block a, and went back home. Went back. So it was about a 45 <laughs> minute period where it picked up and then it was gone. Yeah. Yeah. It, it didn't go as long as, we, as, as it typically does. Lorenzo, thanks for this. Good luck on Sunday. We'll yeah, see you I appreciate Friday. it. Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo Feeling Alexander, good. Bill's linebacker with the lowdown. We do it every Friday at 2 o'clock. The lowdown brought to you by. Hutches, redefining city dining. Chris and I coming back. One Bills Live presented by Colada Health on Buffalo Bills Radio.